in Geneva. Welcome also to all who are following us online through the WF and El Pais website. We are gathering today under a powerful headline, in my view, the return of the state, where next for industrial policy. I think it's one of the most significant trends of the changing times we are living in. We've got a wonderful panel here, assembled by the WEF. I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers we have today to you. Uh, from the other side of the stage, starting from there, we've got Mr. Music Gafela, who is Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry of Botswana. Next, we've got Mr. Mark Swilling, Chairman of the Board of Directors at Development Bank of Southern Africa. Next, we've got Madame Kelly Tsai, Dean and Chair Professor at Hong Kong University in Science and Technology. And here, close to me, we've got Mr. Gero Korman, Head of Digital Technologies and Platforms at Volkswagen Group Production. Thank you for being here. I'm sure it's going to be a very thought-provoking panel. So uh, let's go for it. Um, as you all know, we are living in times marked by hardening uh, competition between powers, threatening climate change, concerning global health issues. All of those are converging towards the first idea of our panel, which is the return of the state. And the second one, the second syntagma of our headline, the industrial policy, is one of the most meaningful ways in which uh, their state is returning. It is, of course, in purely economical terms, thinking about jobs and growth, which is the idea of the conference here in Geneva, thinking about supply chains, thinking about innovation, risks of protectionism, but also in terms of geopolitics. For many, industrial policy can be a factor defining the future balance of power between states. So I think we have to think about the two aspects of it. And uh, of course, big players are fully swinging in this field. We've got Made in China 2025. We've got in the US the IRA and the Science and Chiefs Act. The EU is getting sacked together in this and other actors of different size and different parts of the planet are, are moving also. So we're gonna try to think about this. We're gonna try to think whether industrial policy can achieve its objective, avoiding, provoking bad backlashes, uh, trying to keep this into the realm of competition, not steering towards confrontation. We are trying to take stock of where we are in specific important places uh, right now, who could be winners and losers, what are main opportunities and risks. So let's go for it, let's start the discussion. I would like to do it showing to you some data assembled by the WEF in its um, Chief Economist Outlook, published today. I think they are very significant. I hope they can be shown here. Here they go. So uh, please have a look at that. Um, I think it's a very significant data here. 74% of the economists polled in this uh, believes that this trend will become a widespread approach to economic policy globally. Alarmingly, 90% believe it will deepen geoeconomic geo rivalry and tension. 70% that it will stifle competition. And 68% that will lead to a problematic increase in sovereign debt levels. And then uh, we have here not much confidence about positive outcomes. 39% believe it could be a driver of innovation. Only 20% believe it will lead to an overall increase in global economic activity. So this is the context, this is the forecast of chief economists. It's not very well um, optimist. And on the ground of this data, I would like to kickstart the conversation. I would like to start with you, Minister. Um, as a political leader coming from a, a country of what many call now the global south. I would like to hear your assessment of what's going on right now in industrial policy, which is mainly happening in the northern hemisphere. How do you look at it? I guess there must be some part of it that are interesting to you. For example, investment in green technologies that may produce a reduction of emissions in the future. But other things may be concerning. 
how do you look at it from the Global South perspective, from your country? Uh, thank, thank you very much, Andre. We, since 2014, um, we, we embarked on industrial policy in, in Botswana, where I come from. And one of the things which we, we are embracing under it is, is pursuit of green technology and increasing reduction of reliance on fossil, on fossil fuels. But we, we are a larger part of the African continental free trade area. We are, larger, we are part of... Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon, sir. <clears throat> we are also a part of the Southern African Customs Union, NSADC. African countries in the south, um, out of all of these regional blocks, have embarked on industrialization. Our heads of state have mandated ministers responsible for trade to embark on it. Because for quite a long time, um, Africans had been relying on a resource, on, uh, the economies were pretty much based on, on resources, but increasingly the trend is towards uh, industrialization of Africa. Now, the challenge, of course, that we have is, is, is the manner by which we will accomplish that. Our pursuit of green technology is in the forefront of our minds, but as the AU has, has declared, it's got to be um, a, a just transition. It cannot be... Um, a, sudden, a, a sudden occurrence. Uh, of course, we are all um, committed to uh, meeting the, the, the Paris Agreement and uh, a zero emission by, 20, by, by 20, uh, 20, 20, 2030. But there is a challenge, Andrew. Um, there is a, a challenge there uh, in that we, we are, we are, a lot of Africans don't have access to energy. And um, even, even under the use of fossil energy, they still do not have access to energy. So as politicians, it is absolutely important that uh, for, for us to, to be meaningful to them as leaders, they should access energy. It's going to take quite a while, I must say, um, for a, a transition to occur in terms of which uh, the pursuit of green energy then becomes a day-to-day -day occurrence. But I must say, from the Botswana's perspective, we have embarked on a lot of programs uh, which um, support our green technology. We are quite um, alive to our geographic location uh, where we are. We have 3.2, 3,200 hours of sunshine in a year. So this is an opportunity for foreign direct investment in green, green energy in, in Botswana. We do not have much, we don't, water is not abundant. So hydro, hydro energy is not something that we can really look into, but wind energy is. Uh, the southern part of Botswana, the, mm, the southwest part of Botswana, there is some potential uh, of use of wind uh, in those areas for, for, for energy. So as we transition towards 2030, we need to, uh, ag we, I would really urge that the whole world should be alive to these challenges which uh, Africans do, 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 do have in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the drive towards the complete eradication of, of fossil, fossil energy. And, and, and okay. Thank you very much, Minister. I'd like now to hear your views, Mr. Zwilling. Uh, industrial policy is changing. It's changing its nature quite strongly. I'd like to ask, what is your point of view about this change from someone who has a very profound knowledge of a big region, sub-Saharan Africa, how do you see this change of nature of industrial policy worldwide? Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think the reality is that this conversation is pitched in, as, as part of the discussion about changing geopolitical realities. Part of that is the extraordinary competition that's been triggered uh, as by the Inflation Reduction Act. What this effectively means is that the U.S. is going to trigger a, comp a competitive dynamic around industrial policy for green tech with Europe, which in turn is going to further stimulate Chinese investment to participate in that competitive dynamic. All of that doesn't spell good news for the Global South. The Global South is effectively excluded from that dynamic. So what we have to face is 
industrial policy strategies that are going to have to address typical Global South challenges. And this new geopolitical reality is going to change the cost of capital, is going to change the, the directionality of financial investments, which up until now in terms of green tech has been fairly ad advantageous for the Global South. I suspect that that's going to shift. So that's, that's my first point. The second point is that survey I find very depressing. Why? Because essentially the chief economists are talking about uh, old generation industrial policies, which were about picking winners, about cost-benefit analysis, uh, and about market failure. The new generation industrial policies are not about that. The new generation industrial policies are really about facilitated collaborations around mission-led industrial policies that create innovation spaces and spaces for thinking about blended finance solutions that could result in the creation of whole new industries, whole new opportunities. So that's, I think we need to take seriously that. If you, if you, if you hang on to a traditional conception of industrial policy, you end up thinking in terms of, oh, this is going to worsen the, the sovereign debt crisis. Oh, this is going to diminish uh, competition. Actually, new generation industrial policies are actually having opposite effects, uh, which is actually what underpins the, the IRA, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, and various uh, strategies in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So I would ask us to just think critically about what we mean by uh, industrial policy mm -hmm. going forward. And you know, as an academic, I would say that as the chair of the board of a development finance institution, I have to say that because we have to participate in blended finance solutions. Thank you very much. I would like to hear now from you, Madame Tsai. Mrs. Willing has just stressed the geopolitical aspect of these new trends in industrial policy. I really would like to hear your point of view about how China's industrial policy has been evolving lately. It is, of course, a very important actor worldwide, and uh, I would be really happy to hear from you on this. Sure. I, first, uh, thank you for including me on this panel. It's an honor to be here. And I really appreciated our, uh, my panel co-panelists' point about differentiating <coughs> among different types of industrial policy. I think there's a misunderstanding that China's uh, rapid growth and becoming the world's factory is due to industrial policy, and, and that's really quite inaccurate. For the first couple of decades of China's reform era, starting in the late 1970s, there were efforts to engage in industrial policy, but it was actually bureaucratically too fragmented and there was just too much, it was actually quite disorganized at the central level to be able to pull off a type of coherent industrial policy like what you might see in Japan, Korea, Taiwan in the post-war era. It really wasn't until 2008 that it developed the bureaucratic capacity to have something resembling industrial policy, and it wasn't until 2015 that China then launched its very ambitious Made in China 2025 industrial policy, which I think it's important to understand the context under which that occurred. Um, China's evolved from a familiar model of state capitalism to what we would consider now party state capitalism. And this, this evolved due to a deep sense of insecurity, both in terms of domestic concerns as well as external perceived threats. And these really started to bubble up in the late 2000s uh, with the uh, the global financial crisis with riots in um, Xinjiang, protests in Tibet, um, social instability, growing, uh, growing corruption. These were all dom perceived domestic threats to the Chinese Communist Party's rule. And then externally, there, were, um, there, there was uh, Arab Spring. The global financial crisis was a real wake-up call in terms of China's dependence on export markets. And then I think more than anything else, the Edward Snowden affair led China to realize how risky it was to be dependent on foreign technology. And so all of that combined, the perceived um, internal and external threats, led Beijing to really take industrial policy seriously and securitize its economy and come up also with this concept of comprehensive national security, which was introduced in 2014, right before uh, the Made in China 2025, which identifies 17 different types of security for China, like ecological security, economic security, biosecurity. It's comprehensive national security. So China's industrial policy has been securitized. I mean, its, um, its mode of political economy has been securitized very heavily, and that's expressed in industrial policy. Uh, 
I, what, just one last point I'd like to make is that industrial policy isn't always effective, so it's really important to look sectorally, you know, by sector. China's most successful companies, its internet companies, the um, fintech, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, they were not the products of industrial policy. Uh, their most uh, successful surveillance firms, Hikvision and Dahua, again, private sector, not, not, did not benefit from industrial policy until they were already very large. And so the, the sectors that have benefited, um, PV, uh, photovoltaics, um, solar, they produced so much they had to export. They didn't do well in autos though, and commercial aircraft was an utter failure. So I think it's really important to, to keep that in mind when we're thinking about industrial policy. It doesn't always work and it can be a colossal waste of resources. Thank you, so we just heard uh, that it's not always successful. Mr. Coleman, uh, how do you see this trend unfolding in Europe and the United States? Volkswagen is, of course, a global group. It's taking a look at uh, things worldwide, uh, analyzing it for deciding its strategic investment for the future. How do you see specifically how things are evolving in Europe and the United States, so important actors globally and for your company? So we, we see those um, yeah, big programs um, in the US and in Europe showing up. Uh, we have seen protectionism also in Europe, uh, like uh, Volkswagen Group producing car all over Europe, all over the world, uh, with Brexit, etc. And our very complex supply chains, we were, we were facing challenges. Um, while my colleague just said about industrial policy, what is, what is actually targeting, what's part of it, automotive often was in the, in the past and is still in, in terms of components. Um, and this is like um, something that we try to leverage. Yeah? So um, the US pushing for um, more local production um, is nothing new, right? So in the automotive industry, local content is a very familiar term. Uh, so trying to match regulations uh, in terms of where manufacturing actually happens. Um, that's something that the automotive industry as a global industry uh, is very familiar. Um, and that is happening in the US, that is happening in Europe, but it's accelerating. I think what's actually new is that it's not only about production capacity, that's one part of the story, like for example, like of course Volkswagen is investing in uh, factories in the US, a new battery factory for the North American market in Canada uh, to, 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 to fulfill rather the idea of build components and cars uh, locally for local markets. But I think what's new is also that it goes deeper in the value chain in terms of what kind of components. Uh, so restrictions and limitations and regulations about what kind of components and even what kind of manufacturing technology can be used and will be used in different, uh, different areas. Um, will it, will it uh, accelerate innovation? Um, well, if I follow the report, uh, probably not. Um, will it give some steering or might give some advantage for uh, specific countries? Uh, we will see in the near future. Thank you very much. I will start now a new round, but I would like to tell you that afterwards uh, we will have some time for questions from you. So uh, please, if you, if you wish to ask, just later on I will open up, raise hands, and we'll go for that. So, uh, Minister, since uh, we've, got, uh, we've got you in this panel, I, I would really uh, like to have a political view because we've seen how much this policy is intertwined with uh, uh, geopolitics. And uh, we see that many consider this as a way to reduce dependency on others, to increase resilience, to, gain, to get an edge over competitors in strategic technologies, um, and therefore to assure, ensure their economic strength in this global power uh, struggle. So we think it's unfolding in a frightening way and it's mainly from the north. So uh, I, I would like to go with a political question. How do we avoid this going towards confrontation? What do you expect from these great powers which are on course of something that may have 
bad effects on the rest of the world, especially on the South. How do we avoid this spiraling out of control? Well, um, the, the global powers, I would really invite them to, uh, to peer into the, the, whole, the African agenda, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, and to learn what collectively Africans are in pursuit of. Our, our approach as Africans, Botswana included, is, is one of peaceful coexistence. Am I not audible? Oh, thank you, sir. Peaceful coexistence, um, economic integration more than, in, than, than our protectionist tendencies. So the way we look at it, even at the regional level, is uh, a, an approach in terms of which we create winners of all of us. Uh, we avoid as much as possible um, scenarios of uh, uh, or policies which, uh, like the IRA, which perhaps may compel manufacturing to take place exclusively in a particular area. We try, to, we try to spread it across the whole of Africa because if it becomes, if the competition spirals out of control, it's likely to then beget a lot of unrest, a lot of um, um, global uh, geopolitical uh, tension, and possibly it can pl plunder us into, into, into war. Um, some of the, the conflicts that we've had in Africa, they have their roots in, in economic economic disparity and economic inequalities. So we approach it from that point of view, and I'd really urge the, the, the rest of the world, I mean, America included, and Europe, uh, to, to uh, pursue industrialization in a, in a way which, which accommodates peaceful coexistence. Give some and take, take some, uh, not when I take all um, approach. So the, the RA, <laughs> Uh, I must say with respect, there are some parts of it which are quite useful to us and good, but there are some which are in sharp conflict with our outlook as, as Africa. We approach it, as I said, as a collective. And I can't speak um, um, from Botswana's perspective alone uh, because we, we, we have agreed to be a team, the whole of Africa, sir. So, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Mr. Zwilling, uh, I'd like to ask you, do you think there is scope for the sub-Saharan region to get ahead with industrialization. How should the region position itself in this new global scenario? Uh, do you think, uh, do you look at it with optimism? Do you think, is it possible to go ahead? Or are you pessimistic about this? I'd be pessimistic if the focus was traditional industrial policies, picking winners and expecting bureaucracies to manage innovation. Um, then the predictions we saw will come true. Um, the broad-based, mission-led, coalition-delivered uh, uh, approach to industrial policy has got much greater potential. I think we're seeing that at, at a global level, for example, around oceans. The new ocean agenda is, is, is very much uh, a broad-based mission. We have to save the ocean, and a multiplicity of coalitions are emerging around that. Uh, I've done work for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, which is pursuing quite strongly a green industrialization policy for the region. And the outcome of that work is very much about the kinds of coalitions that would be required to ensure that there are centers of excellence that emerge uh, as partnerships between public, private, and civil society sectors to kind of grow um, high potential areas. Uh, which can be in energy, yes, of course, but also mobility. Uh, we can't replicate the old style concrete and car kind of combination that clogged up uh, cities in, in the developed parts of the world, uh, as well as communications, where we are leapfrogging over uh, copper cables and, the, and food, food systems. Food systems in particular are really about focusing on new ways of managing soils and, and, and nutrient cycles that result in localized value chains that can actually feed Africa. So those are just examples of where uh, everything depends on the kinds of coalitions that get facilitated for innovation and flows of capital uh, to happen. The bottom line is a lot of Africa's dreams are going to be scuppered because of the rising costs of capital and increasing indebtedness. Unless we, if we don't think of industrial policy in this more creative way, those problems are going to get in the way. 
uh, and, and, that's, and we're going to end up with another lost decade. Thank you very much. Uh, Madame Tsai, I would like to hear about uh, a very, a very um, important issue in this sector. It's about microchips. We've seen tensions growing about uh, this specific area, which is fundamental for all industrial policy. We've seen the Biden administration taking steps recently, I think it was in past autumn, to restrict exports uh, towards China. Uh, then we saw how other important countries uh, like Japan or the Netherlands, which have uh, important companies uh, in this uh, field, that uh, apparently are following uh, the lead of the United States, restricting the sports towards China. So my question is, how is China reacting to this? Since it's so strategic, so strategic for the whole area, how do you see them reacting? Uh, how is that unfolding? Yeah, it's a really important question. And I especially appreciated the way that you just framed the context for that question, because what we see here is the rise of a security dilemma in the economic realm. It used to be that in, this, in international relations, security dilemmas would refer to when a country pursues activities to make itself feel secure has the unintended consequence of making other countries feel less secure, who then in turn try to make themselves feel secure. And this leads to a, a downward spiral of mutual insecurity in the arms race during the Cold War was the perfect example of that. And it used to, and then for a good part of the 80s and the 90s and through the early 2000s, it seemed that economic interdependence was a way to foster cooperation. And, um, in, but instead, what we've seen now is the rise of a security dilemma uh, in the economic realm, where China's Made in China 2025 was in reaction to its sense of both economic as well as national insecurity. Then in turn, the US comes along with the CHIPS Act in response. And now you ask, what is China's reaction? It feels even more insecure, right? So more specifically, its response has been um, first to um, be, be, uh, use very kind of wolf warrior discourse saying that it's going to backfire on the US, it's not going to work out. Uh, second, um, it has accused the U.S. of violating WTO rules. Um, third, it is uh, stepping up efforts to invest. Um, there are all these state government organized um, investment funds. Over a trillion dollars have been poured into them in, in, at different levels. And the problem with them, though, is all this investment, those dollar figures look really intimidating and scary, right? Fueling that economic security dilemma. But if you actually look where the money is going, they've had to replace several fund managers of the what they call the big fund uh, of their national integrated circuit investment funds because of corruption. But uh, you know, so much money is going into it, but I think it's important not to get too intimidated by it. Um, other reactions include Huawei claiming that it can now manufacture, um, a, I think, a 14 nanometer wafer, that, that it's developing the internal capacity to do it. Um, it's very nervous that Japan is, is, def is going to stop supplying it with components. And so the reaction is both kind of external um, anger and defensiveness, and then an internal even greater insecurity, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Mr. Corman, I'd like to hear your point of view about uh, how the global landscape of production might change. Um, we are in this since quite uh, uh, a few time now. Uh, data uh, tells us that there is no deglobalization, but probably there is a metamorphosis of globalization towards a more politically pushed uh, globalization, a more polarized uh, globalization, near-shoring, in-shoring, etc. So how do you see the perspective for the new global production landscape since you work for a, such a globalized uh, company? Yeah, so I think from, the, from an automotive point of view, like automotive is going to like its biggest transformation ever. And it has different dimension and all dimension are uh, influenced by industrial policy. So starting with the product itself, so from combustion to more sustainable um, um, yeah, mobility. Uh, of course, industrial policy can steer, it can accelerate, can slow down developments here. The same is for 
autonomous driving as a product, right? So we go from uh, driving the cars ourselves towards autonomous technology. Um, but that's all over the globe. Uh, the second question is what you mentioned and what I just said in the, in the first round of questions, uh, where to manufacture and how does uh, supply chain look like? Uh, so one challenge the automotive industry is facing is how to increase and how to make uh, supply, ch supply chains more resi resilient. And this comes along with a trend that we can see towards more um, vertical integration. So to do more components um, in-house, um, like batteries, et cetera, et cetera, that come along with this, with this transition. Um, so, and this comes also along with the question on where to manufacture, right? Uh, as I said, like the local for local, the local content topic is nothing new. It has accelerated and it was always on the agenda for the automotive companies. Uh, building up joint ventures in China, producing locally uh, in, 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 in Asia, in Africa, etc., um, to leverage um, incentives of the, of the countries. But the third dimension is now on how to manufacture. So what kind of technology are you using? And the question is, can you leverage the same technology all over the globe, or are you facing limitations? So that specific technologies that have been developed somewhere in the world are protected and cannot be used somewhere else. Um, and I'm talking about technology like advanced manufacturing technologies. I'm talking about technology that are AI uh, enabled, artificial intelligence enabled. And I think that's also an opportunity yeah, for, for countries to, to try to use that as an accelerator while others still try to figure out regulations. Um, and on how to, how to um, optimize manufacturing. I'm not talking about AI like ChatGPT and all these uh, next generation of agents, etc., that will change our lives. I'm talking about using artificial intelligence for quality inspection, etc., etc., which in many countries is not yet allowed, so it's not, um, it's not like an official uh, quality tool. But we see like artificial intelligence being applied more and more and again, the question, can you leverage the same technology across the globe, or do we see very local for local manufacturing technologies? Thank you. Well, I would like to open up the discussion. If uh, you would like to pose questions to our speakers, um, <coughs> we'll be very happy to take it. Please, go ahead, if you can introduce yourself, and then go for a question. Thank you. Good morning. John, uh, John Morrison, Institute for Human Rights and Business. This question of interdependency, <clears throat> I think many of you sort of correlate interdependency with stability and peace uh, as a good thing. Just want to drill into that a little bit more. Is the current interdependency we've had the past 30 years actually been good for people? And is it something worth preserving? Um, and if so, how do we preserve it? Or should we let it fall away and re try and rebuild another form of interdependency? Are you, would you like... No, anybody on the panel, because, I mean, the IRA has been cited in the US as as, 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 as unfair element of competition, etc. I'm intrigued by what governments could or should be doing to safeguard interdependency and to strengthen it, or whether actually the current interdependency we have is not worth preserving. That's, that's my question. Thank you for your question. Some of, some of you would like to take it? Please, go ahead. Well, a lot depends on what you mean by interdependency. So if you mean uh, multilateralism, from a Global South point of view, yes, we've benefited from um, a relatively peaceful world. But if you mean in interdependence from a developmental point of view, it hasn't been good news. Um, and, uh, you know, and Larry Summers uh, ended the last, was talking at the last session of the, of the WEF in, in January in Davos. And he listed a whole bunch of uh, you know, good things that are happening uh, and some challenges. And then he ended off with a, by saying, the, one of our biggest problems is no one's figured out how to relocate capital from the global south, from the global north to the global south. And I was struck by that because in the context of, well, the majority of solar and wind resources are in the global south. The majority of the biodiversity adaptation resources are in the global south. But the majority of the minerals we're going to need to build the new infrastructures are in the global south. The capital is in the global north. And in the context of geopolitical, rising geopolitical competition, which is going to be exclusionary of the global south, we, from a development point of view, 
face very serious challenges. And it's not going to be good for the world because the resources, uh, you know, how those resources are going to get uh, uh, accessed uh, if you have strong states that are going to say, no, no, we want better terms. Any more questions? Please, go ahead. Uh, I think our mic is coming. Thank you very much. So my name is Jamal Grip, Director of Economic Development, Integration and Trade at the African Union Commission, based in Addis Ababa. I'd like just first to salute our minister. So just two, three issues or comments. Well, first of all, what I have noticed really, there are those drivers of the economy, even of the industrial policies. The, the drivers, we know them. It's more or less North Africa. Uh, North America, you have Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Southeast Asia. So these are really the drivers. But the future, I'd like really that uh, in the next edition of the WEF, that we think about the future, how to position the, the world now going forward about 20, 30, 50 years from now. And I think the future is Africa. It's not because I'm from Africa that I'm, but the reality is there. The CFTA is on the African free trade area is already there. And within 10 years, they will be coming with one of the most biggest single market in the world. It's about 1.5 billion population. I'm not just talking, I'm talking about the opportunities. And we see some of the countries that are taking advantage from now and coming in. And I see other remaining within talking with those big countries like big, uh, as I said, the drivers, U.S., Europe, U.S., China, U.S., I don't, but not talking about U.S. And, and, and frankly, there are, there are those big uh, things happening in the, in the world, but there is a reality. And the reality of today, the leaders, the African leaders are not the same of the 60s or 70s. There is a huge shift. And I can tell you, being really, even in the front of the AGOA, that the uh, the African Growth Opportunity Act discussion in the U.S., things have changed. And I'd like really to call on the WEF to think about going forward to position Africa as the hub of prosperity, which is what, we call, what I call shared prosperity. Because when I, look, when I listen to his Excellency, the Minister, about the green transition, yes, but we are not responsible of that one. So for me, going forward, there are, uh, there are many... Uh, opportunities in Africa. One of the, the I think, the GVC, what we are working a lot at the African Union Commission with the UNECA, with the AFDB. Uh, for me, it's something that we have never talked about the subcontracting. Uh, some contractors, we never ever done a study about the subcontractors in, in Africa. This is something I believe is the future because, uh, yeah, this is uh, not only talking about that very advanced technology, but the middle. So th for me, the WEF should a little bit shift, really talking only about those, but bringing to south, north-south discussion. Thank you. Do you have a question? No, for me, uh, how do you see, for example, the role, not as, as a provider of, uh, but how do you see the, the future? For example, green technology, yes, battery, that, <laughs> lithium. We know where is it based now, where do you have the, result, the, the raw material. We know where is it located. How do you see the future? Do you think this is the really, uh, the, this, do you think really it's the real future? Talking about the uh, electrical car, do you think this is going forward for 50, 60, 100 years? And how are you thinking about how to recy recycle those batteries, yeah, yeah, the lithium well, one and this? I think like the advice and trying to think in the future, like, uh, let's try to, let me try to answer it in a way that we have been, we have been talking about markets, right, and, and consumers in different markets, and I think you touched based on that some people might underestimate the future market Africa, etc. like, uh, happy to discuss. Um, and then we talked about product, like selling cars, producing cars. We touched based on, oh, it's not about the product, it's about components. We talked about chips, we talked about uh, chips not being uh, able to, like making supply chains even more difficult and, and even more complex because you can't use the same uh, components. I'm, I mentioned also technology in terms of manufacturing technology. And there will be an age where we see uh, it's even about sharing data. Uh, so how to connect the world in terms of sharing data and giving access to data. Um, and I think that's something we have to have in mind. Yeah? Um, 
like that everybody is doing is, uh, on its own for own markets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with own technology that will not work out uh, because it's it's not leveraging the capability of this of, of this planet in terms of resources, in terms of uh, many many other topics. And in order to make sure that we also um, um, save our Earth and beyond, right? Um, like I think it's it's crucial to think beyond just like where are markets and, and, and where, to, where to sell products. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. But please, just straight to the question. We have yes, not, not, much time, <laughs> not much time left. Thank you. Rachel Dorenzi Chana from Egon Zender. Um, you mentioned old industrial policy versus new industrial policy. They're obviously created by humans, by leaders. Can you tell me how far we are along that transition in the mindset from an old to a new. I think the, the shift is taking place more, more in practice than, in conceptual, than with any conceptual clarity. Somebody like Mar Mariana Mazzucato is trying to, to give a conceptual framing of what's already emerging. But if you just listen to uh, the panelists from, from Volkswagen and you hear the same from Siemens and so on, the, previ the previous paradigm was about cheap labor, long extended value chains, free flow of capital, no care for the environment. Now the, the paradigm has shifted. Circularity, local, localized value chains, costlier labor they can, they can handle, they can pay more. Uh, environment matters and constrained capital. In that, in that environment, you need, you, you, states have to return and play a role in creating not a disciplined regulatory specification, which, like, as you say, failed in China to, in some sectors, uh, but managed by bureaucracies, but uh, an opportunity space uh, where problem solving through collaborations can take place uh, in new kinds of environments where you know, the language is about blending, blending finance, blending knowledge, accessing uh, opportunities and multiplicity of spaces, but taking into account these new drivers. Please. Could we move faster? We can move faster if we actually understand what we're up to uh, and that the, that the old paradigm simply is not going to work. Uh, you know, in our context, uh, we don't have the kinds of bureaucracies even if we wanted old-style industrial policy. In South Africa, we've tried and failed many times to do that. So, I was Andre to, to comment yes. on, the, on, on the question about the, about the future. We are, we are quite um, concerned in Africa about the future. Um, as we transition to green energy, especially in the automobile industry, already we have a lot of African countries which are, uh, have an influx of um, in exportation of, of, of gray, gray, gray vehicles to them. Uh, a lot of the countries in the Central Africa and some in Southern Africa, South Africa has prohibited that entry. But we are seeing an influx, and we, we, think, we think that once we, you know, we, we move away from combustible engines, we're going to see an influx of dumping, of dumping of vehicles in, in, in Africa. Already, the, already it, it is occurring. So we just, if we could cooperate with each other, so that those which are not usable anymore in far distant places, they shouldn't be shipped. They really shouldn't be shipped over to, because what happens is that they find communities which are in dire straits, are in dire need. And they, these are usables for their own day-to-day -day getting by. So it's readily attractive to them to, to embrace them. But in the long term, we are really going to see a catastrophe of getting rid of that which is not useful, but sending it elsewhere in Africa. It's really a problem. I would really urge, especially from, from, the, from Asia, because that's where a lot of them do come, do, do come from. And we, we, it's difficult for politicians, once they have arrived, for us to then not accept, accept them. But if from their source, the source itself could stop us sending them. That could really help us a great deal. Thank you. Thank you. I know there are more questions, but we really have to wrap up. So I just would like to give a final word to you, Madame Tsai. A, a bullet point, if you agree, about state and party capitalism in China. Could you just give
give us a point and that we think there is a, 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 an important think, uh, thinking about that uh, all, all over the world. What would you say about that? How would you explain it very briefly? Okay, sure. I think the rise of party state capitalism is due to a deep sense of the Chinese Communist Party's insecurity about both perceived domestic and perceived external threats. So to the extent that the policies taken by other countries can be framed in less threatening ways, <laughs> I think that could be a step towards de-escalating um, what has become an increasingly tense geopolitical situation between China and OECD countries. Well, thank you very much for being with us today here in the room and also all those who follow us online. I would like just to get some takeaways from this session. Um, well, uh, I think it's clear from, from the thinking of our speakers we are in the midst of a profound transformation with many risks in it, many risks. We've seen it from their words and also uh, with the data of the chief economist outlook. So, well, uh, hopefully uh, it will not be uh, off uh, spiraling into confrontation. There is a lot, of, a lot of potential in it, but a lot of risks. Time will tell. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you.